Good day, Carl. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks, Guy. Well, thank you so much. Um, for our audience, could you please introduce yourself and first start off with where did you grow up and where did you where did you go to college and what did you study? Sure. Uh, so my name is Carl Kopp. I grew up in a little town in um, uh, western Pennsylvania called Butler, PA, which was about 45 minutes north of Pittsburgh. So I went to school uh, at Knock High School, Knock Knights, and uh, I actually then went to school in Dickinson College in Carlisle, PA. Only two kinds of people know about that college. It's uh, lawyers, because there's a law school right there, Dickinson Law School, which has no affiliation at all with the undergraduate. And there's a huge car show every year in Carlisle. So your car mechanic knows a lot about Carlisle because she or he go there. But that's about it. Everyone else is like, Farley Dickinson? I'm like, no, not Farley Dickinson. That's not the Well, place. thank you. Uh, can, you tell us a little, can you tell us, <laughs> uh, we had a little transmission uh, hiccup there. Um, oh, sure. Can you tell us where you live now and uh, what you do? I know that you're a full professor, but can you explain a little bit about that for our audience? Yeah, sure. So uh, I went to, uh, I did my graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And then after a while, I uh, eventually ended up in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania at uh, Bloomsburg University. So Pennsylvania has 14 state universities, uh, not Penn State is not one of them. University of Pitt's not one of them. Temple's not one of them. They're state-owned universities, and uh, they're meant, they originally started as teacher colleges, and then they grew up to universities. And so I teach there, preparing students to design, develop, and deliver online and face-to-face uh, -face instruction. So I'm a professor, full professor of instructional technology at Bloomsburg University, uh, teaching graduate students, uh, introducing them to the field, which is kind of exciting. Very cool. Thank you. Can you share with us some of the more interesting things? things that you've worked on in your career, either as a professor teaching students or as a consultant, because I know that you do that as well. I do. So one of the really coolest consulting things I ever did was with Pearson. And right after I'd written my book, uh, Gadgets, Games, and Gizmo for Learning, they said, hey, we want to create a gamified high-stakes high testing application. And so I got on the phone with them one week and was talking to them. And I said, well, yeah, we're probably going to need an artist to do this. Next week in the call, they go, hey, Carl, we want you to meet the artist. I'm like, wow. And then I said, yeah, we're probably going to need a psychometrician. Next week, Carl, I want you to meet the psychometrician. So like every resource I asked for, we got. It was absolutely amazing. I've never had, you know, being in academia, we never have that experience. It was wild. And so uh, what we did then is we created this kind of whole, uh, we called it Zeos Academy, and it was this whole idea of, of you were a superhero and you gained superpowers by upping your testing ability. And then you could challenge people. You could create like a biology test and challenge your friend to take the biology test. And so that was a really, really cool project. Um, had a lot of fun. We did a session where we actually brought in uh, kids. So we spent two days like brainstorming, a lot of design thinking. Uh, and then we brought kids in and we had a paper like that night, the artist drew it all on paper and the kids literally would take a pencil and went through the process. So that was really one of the coolest uh, projects that, that I've done. Um, I also did a really cool project. I created an online uh, sales game called Zombie Sales Apocalypse, which was a lot of fun. So basically the idea behind that game was uh, that you were a sales rep and you had to sell your product into this office and everyone was infected by the zombie virus. And if you said the wrong thing, uh, they would eventually start to turn into a zombie. So the idea was you were getting immediate feedback on incorrect choices that you were making. It was a branching kind of story game. So that was, that was a lot of fun. And then I, I recently got into creating a bunch of card games, which has been really cool. And I've gotten some really good feedback about that. So it's really interesting how I'm, I'm finding that people really kind of want to go back a little bit to, a technology free experience um, for the camaraderie and the conversation and you know those types of things so those are those are some pretty cool projects and then you know the books were cool my favorite book is sell gadgets games and gizmos it took me years to write that book um, a funny story about that after I wrote that book uh, it took a lot I mean it took a lot that was one of my first big books it took a lot to write that 
I was at a party or something and my wife was beside me and somebody was talking to me and I said, yeah. And when I write my next book, and literally my wife burst out in tears. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. That's not good. So that um, that taught me a lot on a lot of different levels. <laughs> so I got much better with uh, writing the books. It's not as big of a deal. Well, that next book was the gamification of learning and instruction. Is that correct? Yeah. So that was a that was a that was a lot. Of, that was a really interesting book. I um, had to fight with the publisher to get the word gamification in the title. So I had proposed a title, and they said, no, nobody knows what this term is. It's not a real term. And I'm like, yeah, but without that term, it's not really going to work. And uh, so I, I looked, and Forbes had written some articles about it, and Inc. had written some articles about it. And so I said, look, these people are writing articles about it. I think that's the right title. And it turned out that that was the right – that book came out at exactly the right time, um, Whereas I always joke, I wrote uh, Learning in 3D with Tony O'Driscoll about, you know, kind of second life and virtual worlds. And I, I joke, you can pretty much track the end of second life to the day that book came out. <laughs> was, like, Timing is everything. Uh, but the gamification, actually, uh, I think it was at the right time. It had the right uh, message. And it really was in a little bit of backlash to you know, taking the, like you had said, about the 40 hours of watching uh, ERP training or MRP training, you know, it was a backlash against some of the training that people said, oh, I can put PowerPoint online with voice? Oh my gosh, let's do that. And I think gamification was kind of a backlash to some of that uh, mind-numbing instruction. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, we were talking before we hit the record button here about uh, some of my experiences. Because you have this book, Integrated Learning for ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, Who's that for? What's that about? Yeah, so that was my uh, uh, first book that I wrote. So that taught me a couple things. One was how to write a book because my co-author is like, oh, uh, you write chapter one, I'll write chapter two. So I wrote chapter one and then I said, okay, where's chapter two? And he goes, okay, you write chapter three, um, two, I'll write chapter three. And it went the whole way and he <laughs> soon the book was written. I'm like, oh, I can write a book. Um, and then, it's also back when I thought, book contracts were like written in stone and you had to meet all the dates. So I was like, not, that was a crazy time. Now I know there was a little more wiggle room, but basically what I did was I took uh, a lot of the concepts. Uh, so I was helping organizations implement uh, MRP, MRP2 and ERP systems. And what has happened was the training kind of got forgotten. People just said, here's the system and you can go ahead and implement this. And isn't it great? I'm like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We need learning to make this work. And they're like, yeah, they weren't really learning people. They were kind of operations people. And I said, well, okay, you need something like a bill of material called a bill of learning. And the bill of learn and the engineers are like, oh, that makes sense. And then you explode the learning needs and are like, oh, I, I get it. So I use kind of that language to help them. So uh, it, the um, LRP was learning requirements planning. So the whole idea was that you would um, plan your learning requirements in concert with your ERP requirements and your those kind of requirements, and that would make your system work. So that was kind of the I had net um, net learning requirements versus gross learning requirements, like all kinds of uh, terminology to help those folks kind of understand. Oh, I get it. It's just like the 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 operation side, but on the learning or on the human side. So that was really kind of an, an interesting experience. I had a lot of fun with that book, and it, it taught me a lot. Another book is Winning E-Learning Proposals. Yes. Uh, now, tell us a little bit about that. So that was a fun book to write. So once I got to Bloomsburg, so I was working, I was, I started my career as, a, um, or one of my earlier jobs was a one-person training department at this ERP company. And, and I was going to graduate school, and I had one foot in corporate, one foot in academia, and I wanted to switch feet, because everybody said, if you get your doctoral degree and you don't go into teaching you'll be tainted and the academics won't want you and I'm like Ugh, I don't want the academics not to want me so I'm going to go in and teach so I went to Bloomsburg and what attracted me to the program was my predecessor Dr. Hank Bailey had actually set up this group called the Corporate Advisory Council and what they were was uh, at that time it was like his cronies who wanted to hire folks from um, Bloomsburg and they would evaluate the students' work. And he had this class where students had to respond to a mock RFP. They had to create a working prototype, write a 40-page proposal, 
and then present for 20 minutes. And I thought, wow, that's a really great real world application. This is kind of interesting. And so um, I took over Hank's class and Hank gave me all his materials. He's the most gracious person. He was awesome. He still is awesome. And he then said, okay, uh, you know, teach a class. I'm like, well, I got to get this organized. So I organized it and put it together. And that's how I put it into the book, Winning E-Learning Proposals. So my students would have a book to, to work from. And the book actually got a lot more traction. Than I thought, so for example, uh, Kevin Oaks from uh, Oaks Interactive and in some total actually wrote the foreword to it. And then one of my highlights in the field of um, uh, structural design and technology was I got a email one day from Michael Allen, like out of the blue. And, you know, I'd read his books. I had heard him speak. I was like, oh, oh my gosh. And he said, you know, uh, at uh, our organization, we do great jobs with proposals, but every time it's great to have a reminder. And so uh, your book really was a great reminder. And I'm like, wow. So I was on cloud nine for <laughs> quite some time. I'm like, oh, my gosh, Michael Allen actually read my book. So that was kind of a cool highlight of uh, winning e-learning proposals. It, the book still holds up. It needs to be updated, so it's on my list to <laughs> update that book. But mm -hmm. I haven't gotten around to updating it lately. Well, you've certainly been busy. Now let's let's uh, shift gears here to uh, not your latest book, but the one before that, micro learning. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah. So with the gamification, what I was finding was that a lot. The gamification is great for motivation or engaging people, but then the instruction that comes behind that needs to be of a high enough quality to make a difference. And so some of the uh, instruction that I noticed was like, this isn't real, you know, the cutting up of an hour's lecture into five minute pieces because five minutes seemed like a good time frame. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's not good. You know, it's so funny. The same thing happened with Second Life. My first experience in Second Life that prompted me to write learning in 3D was I went into a virtual classroom, sat, sat in a virtual chair, watched virtual PowerPoint. I'm like, what a waste of this technology. So same thing with micro learning. I'm like, if we're going to cut up micro, that's not good. So uh, a former student of mine, actually Robin B. Fleece uh, and I kind of wrote, penned an article for T&D and then they said, hey, this is getting a lot of traction. People are, are really interested in it. Um, can you expand that? So then we wrote the book on, on micro learning. And it's gotten really good traction. Um, so, somebody said it was a little too academic, but um, you know, I, I, I could argue it's not academic. And not, like you know, uh, anyway. So uh, if you don't have an academic base, then what are you doing? You're just making stuff up. So uh, anyway, so the idea was we put that together to give people a plan and methodology for intelligently implementing micro learning. And so that was the idea behind that. And your latest book, Play to Learn, with uh, Sharon Bowler. What what can you share with us about that? Yeah, so that was a fun book. So Sharon and I have for years done a workshop uh, at uh, we did it at ATD, we did it at um, uh, DevLearn for a number of years, and different conferences of helping people take a concept from inception all the way to the creation of a learning game, and we wanted to capture that in. Uh, and codify it so that people that couldn't come to the workshop, because we get people, hey, I couldn't come to your workshop, or I'm trying to sh share your materials, but I don't understand what you meant by this, or I'm confused by this. So we wrote it down in the book and to let people kind of go through that process. So the idea really is, I would say, the book, The Gamification of Learning Instruction, is the theoretical framework of why gamification works and how to make it work. Then I wrote another book, The Gamification Field Book, which is coming down a level, maybe the program level, and then Play to Learn is actually a cookbook. So you pick it up, step one, do this, step two, do this, step three, do that. So it was interesting. I wrote, you know, you write a book and you, get, you put it out there and you get feedback. And people are like, oh, gamification, that's great, but you're not telling me how to do it. So then I did the second book and it goes, well, you're telling me kind of how to do it, but not what to do. And so then Play to Learn was, okay, there's exactly what you need to do. So that was kind of the evolution of those, those three books. Mm -hmm. um, rather than... The hold off on this, my next question here, uh, and maybe forget about it, is you have this thing called Step Away. Yes. Please yeah. enlighten uh, me and the rest of us about this uh, this concept for an uh, unconference, I believe. Yeah, yeah, we're very excited about Step Away. So, so this is the second year of Step Away. The first year, so Kevin Thorne and Deborah Thomas came and said, hey, 
Kevin's like, I found this house in Florida where every room is themed after a different game. So we have a Stratego game room, we have a, a Scrabble room, all, Lego room, operation room. And he said, wouldn't it be great to teach the design thinking or game thinking process in this space where we could go into a room and experience it and talk about it and live it? And wouldn't it be great to have a conference where you get up and you have coffee with the conference presenter and you just BS about, you know, game design or whatever. And we're like, I'm like, Oh my God, that's a great idea. Let's go ahead and do that. So we put together a curriculum, a two day curriculum. It's on September 22nd to 24th. The only 10 people can go. So it's a very intimate conference. And in fact, by the end we were like in tennis shoes or bare feet and there's a pool. And so the idea is that, it's almost a retreat where you get to think more deeply about a concept instead of a conference where there's 10,000 people and you get one hour snippet here and one hour snippet there. You go and you deep dive into the creative, innovative, and um, design process. And the people that have come out of that conference are just like, wow, that's amazing. This is the deepest conference I've been to. They're able to apply it. They have a tangible takeaway. So it's just a, an, a, a way of rethinking conferences and a way of allowing people to literally step away from the hustle and bustle of daily bustle of conferences and really think deeply about something, which is a luxury that we don't have all the time. One of the rooms, I, like, I stay in the clue rooms, clue rooms and escape room. So we did an escape room one night, and then we broke that down. Okay, what kind of things about escape rooms makes sense from an instructional design perspective. And so we talked about that, what kind of things don't make sense, right? So we talked about that. And then one uh, one time they have a scavenger hunt. Okay, what's the scavenger hunt make sense? When doesn't it make sense? Okay, now let's put this into the creation of instruction that you're designing. So it's a very personalized, adaptive experience. It was a it was a great time. I can't wait to go back uh, next next September. Excellent. You 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 mentioned design thinking a couple of times already, and now you just combine it with game thinking. Enlighten us about that. So I think it's kind of funny because, you know, when you when I think about the history of human performance technology and kind of instructional design and everything, the whole focus has always been the learner, but somehow it's gotten convoluted. So people are like, oh, we need human-centered design or design thinking to think back about the learner. I'm like, okay, well, then what have you been doing <laughs> Since then, like, what's going on? Like, why, why isn't training for the learner? Like, it's not for robots. So I think it's kind of funny. So, but anyway, um, I've been doing some work with some uh, consulting um, work, and they're like, hey, we need to, we need to implement some, some design thinking. So design thinking is a five-phase process. IDO kind of like, you know, made it famous. But you know, you start with the empathize, and you, then you brainstorm solutions. Then you go ahead and you do some prototyping, and then you evaluate the prototyping. And it's big in Silicon Valley because you know you build a minimum viable product, but that's rapid pro. That's that's um, formative evaluation. Like I, like it's the same thing. So uh, anyway, so but those concepts and ideas uh, are of value, even though you can label them whatever you like. And so uh, I incorporated a lot. Does uh, game thinking is is like design thinking, but it, the idea is you approach it through the lens of a game developer. So one of the things I always say is that game developers tend to think of action, activity, and performance first. A lot of instructional designers, because of a lot of instructional design schools, teach content first. You know, what's, what kind of content are you teaching? What are the strategies for the content? And it really should be what, what do you want the learner to do or the performer to do at the end, not what do you want them to know. Um, you know, I've had, I had one guy tell me, I don't, <laughs> was in a manufacturing place, like, I don't care what they know, as long as they do this and this and this, I don't care. So, I mean, that's really kind of the idea. So at Bloomsburg, we're very focused on, you know, the performance outcome and the adaptability of models. And so we teach and talk about that model a lot, but it's not a, it's not a huge departure from, you know, kind of what we've been doing already, but it's important to stay up with the terminology and the jargon and, you know, kind of what's happening there. Yes. I was watching a video of you uh, from uh, last year, 2019, where, where you, uh, it was the game thinking uh, talk show. And you were talking about 
uh, challenge and failure and applying game thinking and starting backwards and your orientation with performance, which is what I've always liked about you because you're always a performance guy. Um, um, but, but anyway, so talk to us a little bit about the challenge. And I think uh, uh, in one of these, I thought I heard you say uh, what I think uh, Robert Bork says about uh, uh, desirable difficulties. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A really interesting concept there. Um, so the idea is that um, when I think about, uh, so I always say, always said that gamification was just the cover for you to do what you always should have been doing anyway. And so if you think about learning, a lot of times we design learning and instructional design is taught like this often from this, you know, you break it down into its simplest pieces and then you build it back up. The problem, I mean, that works great for novice learners. The problem is most of us in organizations aren't teaching novice learners. They have some degree of knowledge. And if you start at the very beginning, then you turn them off right away. So oftentimes, challenge, and, and I think it's really wild because a video game doesn't start with like the most base. It challenges you right away. And as soon as you fail on that challenge, then it gives you instruction. And I think that's a really great way to think about it. So, you know, it goes back to uh, Malcolm Knowles, right? Uh, we learn best when we know we don't know something, right? So challenge lets a learner know, ooh, I, I don't know this, which creates the greatest opportunity for uh, learning, the most open-mindedness, and then lets them do this. So I think challenge is a really important part of that. The other important part is the freedom to fail. So in a lot of instructional environments and a lot of learning environments, and you know, I did a lot of work in pharma, and they're like, you, know, you can't teach them the wrong way because they'll accidentally do it. And I'm like, well, then who are you hiring that's going to accidentally? But anyway, um, so the idea, so, what, you know, they're legal and regulatory, don't like that. So um, we can't teach the wrong way. But people learn a lot from failure. And actually, I, I read some really, really uh, interesting research recently that, that they did a study on cardiologists who learn, actually felt they learned more from other people's failure. So the idea was you see somebody else mess up and you go, huh, I'm never doing that. I'm not going to, and you make a mental note, like not to do that. I don't want to be that guy. So it's really kind of interesting how video games have kind of already incorporated this stuff into the design without, you know, the research behind it. And then learning has a lot of research behind it, but people kind of forget or don't often apply that research. So uh, my idea was to bring the two together and kind of a, make it a little bit more palatable but also grind it, it, ground it in the uh, research and the human performance body of knowledge so that people are doing the right thing and it's the cover of, you know, gamification or challenge. Or, you know, we did, a, we did a course one time where the course was beautifully designed from instructional design. Like you walk in and there's the learning objectives and then they went over the model and then they went over the uh, terminology and then at the end they did this little role play. And we completely flipped it. So we had the people come in immediately and we put them in the role. We said, okay, here's what you have to do. Then the irony was at the end, they went through the terminology, the model, everything, but they were totally engaged the whole time. They knew how to do it because they had done the process, not learned about the process. And I think that's really one of the advantages of, of framing things from that game perspective. I have to credit you here because you said learning objectives versus uh, learning objections, uh, which, I, which I heard you say several times in the video. But, uh, I but do I say that from time to time. Well, <laughs> my, my thought is, you know, the first thing that we do, and this is so funny because learning objectives were originally designed for the um, designer of the instruction, yes. not for the learner. But what we do is we give the learner those, I call them learning objections because you say to the salesperson, today we're going to learn four ways to do whatever. And the sales guy goes, yeah, I know five. What a waste of time, right? But I always say it's better to frame it as a question. Wouldn't you like to know the number one way to close business in our industry? Well, yeah, maybe I know it, maybe I don't. Now you have my attention. But if you say, you will learn three ways to close, like people, like, yeah, whatever. So I, I really think we need to re reframe those definitely. I, I so much agree with that. Thank you for that. Let me shift gears here a little bit. Uh, you've mentioned uh, HPT, Human Performance Technology, uh, which other people might call Human Performance Improvement or Evidence-Based Practices for Performance Improvement. Um, can you share with us about your first exposure to this? Where did, where did this come from? Yeah, I, I really think it came from, so early in my career when I was, I, was a, I, was a, I got my first uh, um, position so I, I majored in English and 
almost minored in psychology in my undergraduate. And uh, I got my teaching certificate. And so I was trying to find uh, a job. I didn't want to go into teaching full time. So there was a company in Butler called Applied Science Associates. And nobody really knew what they had, what they did. But there was something with English or, you know, you should try there, Carl. And actually, when I was younger, I was in a safety video because I did some little theater for this company, Applied Science. So I went there and said, hey, I'd like to have an internship here. And they said, well, you know, what do you know? And I said, oh, I know this, I know this. And I said, actually, I used to work here. And they're like, what? And I said, you know, I was a kid in the safety video. But when I got in there and they saw me some time, I'm like, what are you guys doing? This is fascinating to me. And they're basically, it's, you know, human-centered design. Or well, actually, at that particular time, it's performance improvement. We're trying to improve the performance of people in the workplace. Uh, there was some military work. There was some commercial work. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is fascinating to me. Like, you, you study this, you, you kind of, and so that, I just was, so I actually changed my graduate school from educational counseling to instructional technology, and I liked that program because when I was introduced to it, the, the chairman said, we don't think about technology as software and hardware, we think technology as a methodology of systematically examining thing, uh, uh, situation. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, I love it. And so, you know, my dad was an engineer, so I got my dad's brain, but my mom was kind of like a little artsy, so I got her brain. So it was a great combination of kind of the two, and um, that exposed it to me. And then I got really interested. I read, um, it was about the time Michael Hammer and James Champy wrote the book, Reengineering the Corporation, which is about human performance uh, improvement without the humans, basically, right? <laughs> like, just take all people out, automate everything, you'll be fine. Uh, totally missing the whole thing. But uh, anyway, so that got me interested in, oh, can we really, you know, make improvement? And then Gary Rumler wrote in his book, Performance Consulting, about the real opportunity for improvement is the transfer of items from one department to another, getting rid of the silos. And when I was doing ERP and MRP implementations, they were all siloed. And ERP went across the organization, which was a huge change. So there was organizational issues and all that kind of stuff. So that kind of really was the first exposure I, I had to it. And then I had done a course for, there's a company called, or a trade organization, Apex, American Production Inventory Control Society. And I did their just-in-time course. So I studied Duran and Crosby and Deming and their ideas of performance improvement and just got me whole uh, excited about, oh, my gosh, the possibilities of, what can be done was, was pretty amazing. So that kind of got me down that road. And it's interesting, from a structural design point, some of those tools like affinity diagrams, fishbone diagrams, all that aren't used by, you know, instructional designers, but they should be. They're really good tools for root cause analysis and all that kind of stuff. So really got an interest in kind of incorporating those into the practice. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. That's an a interesting segue into my next question, which was, who or what were your biggest influences? Uh, I want to, I ask this question so that we can point others to uh, people or articles or books that you think uh, were impactful to you and your practice. And you've mentioned some of these people now. So it, maybe let's round this up here. Is there yeah. anything in particular, any articles or books uh, besides some of the people that you've mentioned that uh, you might point others to? So one book that I found particularly uh, influential was Everett Rogers' Diffusion of Innovations. So uh, Everett studied back in like the 1960s, 62, I think the book was published, or one version of it, uh, where he studied how innovations make their way through social systems and um, the adoption curve and all that kind of stuff. So I thought that was just fascinating. And the interesting thing, you know, he has the early adopters and the innovators and then he has kind of a gap, and then you have the majority, and et cetera. And so after that, several years after that, a, a gentleman named Jeffrey Moore wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. Uh, well, actually, Inside the Tornado, Crossing the Chasm. And his idea was if you have a technology and you want to get to the mainstream, you've got to cross this chasm from the innovators and early adopters who think a little bit differently, who look at it a little differently. And that really influenced a lot of my work, thinking about that, and the funny thing is, if you take the innovation adoption curve and you take the um, 
Gartner hype cycle and you superimpose them on top of each other, right at the trough of disillusionment is right where the chasm is. So it's really an interesting kind of thought. A lot of people think like that. And then you look at change management models, the drop-off is right there as well. So that really got me thinking about, because I, I was early enough in uh, e-learning that you know we transitioned from laser discs to CD-ROMs to the internet, which took away all interactivity and everything for a number of years. And then when it started coming back up, people weren't adopting it. We actually had that. We actually did a number of e-learning classes where we had all students in there, and we walked them step by step how to get online and go to the e-learning module because they weren't adopting the innovation. Um, so, so I had to spend a lot of time thinking about well, how do I get people to actually use this, which I think is really interesting. So that was uh, that was kind of an interesting journey. So those those were very influential. Of course, Gloria Gary's electronic performance support systems. I had read that. And I came to Bloomsburg, and they had just had Gloria Gary here, and I missed her. And I kept thinking, I've been here like 20 plus years. Like she would come back, and she never did. <laughs> Hank retired, and Gloria never came back. But uh, that was kind of that was uh, a big influence as well. And you know, I mentioned uh, Gary Rumler and kind of his work, and um, it was just an applied science. Like a lot of the people there who had a really uh, grounded view of improving performance. Like we did this really interesting study on mean time to failures for military vehicles. And the Army was getting the mean time to failure data from the manufacturer who's basically swagging it. They were collecting actual mean time to failure, but they were still training on the manufacturer's <laughs> mean time to failure. Top. And we're like, what are you guys doing? It makes no sense. You have the data. Why? Are, so, you know, just projects like that were really kind of fascinating to me. Um, and, and so those are some influences. And then I continue to be influenced. You know, we talk about um, uh, Desirable Difficulty, you know, the book there that I thought was really kind of influential. And we talk about, um, um, I'm really interested in um, um, Desirable Difficulties and, desi and um, Deliberate Practice and how that can actually improve performance. So I uh, continue to be influenced by others in the field and kind of what they're doing and uh, where they're going and the directions that they've, they've come. And, and then I, I like to look outside the field, like I said, to Duran and Crosby and all, the, all those folks who I think, um, you know, they're looking at the same thing, but just from a slightly different direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shifting gears here, uh, if you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do. Now, I normally set this up by saying you're at a neighborhood party. There's a new neighbor. He comes up and he says, Carl, what, what do you do? Right, what, yeah. What's your, what's your short and sweet answer to him that you may right. need to elaborate on later? But Right. So I basically say um, I teach students how to design, develop, and deliver online instruction. That's basically what I, what I tell them. I tend not to get into the gamification if it's not somebody that knows it because they're like, what, what is that? You know, what, you teach people to play games? I'm like, no, 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 it's elements of games. To, yeah. And they're like, what do you mean? Like, you play poker all day? I'm like, no, no. So, I, I don't get into that. I just say I teach people to design, develop, and deliver online instruction. But my mother-in-law still has no idea what I do. It's like, right. oh, he does something with computers. I, I don't know. <laughs> Yes, That's an inside joke for all of us is that no one can understand how you can train others in a job that you don't have. How does that work? <laughs> they just don't, you don't know how to do. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, it was so funny. When I when I first started my one job, like I was going to our controller at the company. I'm like, okay, because the software was accounts receivable, accounts payable. I'm like, okay, what what's a debit? What's a credit? Like that. She literally went behind my back to my boss and said, this guy knows nothing. W what are you doing? And the only reason why I kept that job was because the person that was a trainer before me had students walk out. So my my bar was if students didn't walk out of your class, you were successful. <laughs> it's a low bar. But uh, anyway. <clears throat> I made it. <laughs> <laughs> and here you are today. Well, can you share with us, uh, as a lifelong learner, what your current focus is or your next fo focus for learning and are, are you writing about any of this? Is there articles or books? What's, what, where are you focused? Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm doing a really interesting uh, uh, 
thing right now. I'm creating. So I've been a, a LinkedIn learning author, and that's been wonderful and fantastic. Um, but I set up a studio in my basement, and I've created uh, what I'm calling the T and D Mentor Learning Academy. So it's a, a series of courses, and the idea is that it's for corporations could subscribe to this. So I've created kind of workshop based online classes. So I didn't want the simple lecture. So there's a workbook that goes with the, you have to work through the workbook, kind of like the old correspondence training, right? So, um, and it's very interactive in that you have to do these exercises and it's kind of like me as a mentor talking you through the process. So I have, I actually have one on consulting from the inside or performance consulting. I have one on micro learning that matches the book. I have one on instructional design 101 because you know, there's a lot of people that go into corporations and they're training and they have no background or no experience, which, uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, don't get me on that rant. Cause then issues, another, yes. Yeah. And then the other, uh, one is, you know, of course, of course on, uh, adding game elements to your instruction. So I've got already a couple, um, clients who have subscribed and the idea is that in this consortium, if you're interested, um, you put in what you want for the next course. So every year I'll develop four more courses. And uh, if everybody says, oh, we want a course on instructional design, advanced instructional design, I'll create that course. Or if they want a course on desirable difficulty, create that course. So that's kind of an exciting prospect. I just launched it, just got my first customer talking to some others. So really excited to see how that takes off. I really think there's a different way to do you know, workshops and a different way to have people work through those issues and so uh, that's what I'm working on right now. Um, I'm also working on a book. I, I teamed up with a woman from Microsoft who they've implemented uh, gamification of micro learning to great effect in Microsoft. And they they captured every like every click, every breath, everything. So we're right now sifting through that data, figuring out how to put that into a really impactful book to help others, um, genericizing the model that they use. And then making it so that, well, yeah, of course, Microsoft could do it because they've got, you know, billions of dollars. So you're saying, no, you can do it, too. You don't have to be Microsoft to do that. So we're working on that project as well. That's kind of a that's kind of an exciting uh, project. So, yeah, a couple couple things. Well, let me take you back to the what you first talked about, the, your mentor academy. Did you use the phrase T and D? I did, yeah. Are you a training guy versus a learning guy or I'm what? I'm a learning guy. I'm a learning guy, but L and D was taken. So I'm, like, <laughs> I'm a pragmatist. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I just I just had to ask about that because I'm I'm kind of an old school guy myself. Are you, and I prefer, are you a T and D guy or are you a L &D? I'm a T and D and I you know I blame uh, uh, Peter Senge's uh, book The Fifth Discipline <laughs> for because all my clients switched over from training organizations, training departments to learning departments, yep. which told me that they didn't get what the book was talking about in the first place. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, that was a great. But book. that, uh, yeah. So, um, is this a, to tell stories? Because it just reminds. Well, me I, my first. So my question before that, because it has to do with language. So. Uh, what I want to know is that is there a favorite or perhaps it's not a favorite uh, performance improvement or learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you find that people are using it in a problematic way. It's being misunder, mis uh, conveyed, misconstrued. What yeah, kind wow, of a language? Uh, there <laughs> so one of the things I think is uh, bothersome to me a little bit is the huge dismissal of the Addy model. Okay. Um, lots of people, oh, hold on one second. Sorry, I'm losing battery. So one of the things that uh, a lot of people do is they forget that Addy is about analysis and about making sure that you are centered on the learner. So we did talk earlier, when you talk about human-centered design, that's such a weird phrase to me because everything should be human centered design unless you're designing like i said for robots or maybe it's alien centered design i don't know so i just think that's kind of a strange term and in if you practice instructional uh, design systems design the proper way you always were human centered you always focused on that that was always the right approach so that always kind of 
makes me laugh. And then the other thing that makes me laugh, we did a project years ago for Toys R Us. And we had somebody there in Toys R Us who was helping with the project. And we followed the Addy model to create the instruction. And at the end, they're like, wow, this really works? Like the problem, <laughs> yeah, of course it works. Like if you do it right, it works. So I just think that's funny that, you know, we have to have these new terms and we have to do, you know, successive approximation or we have to do design thinking and all that kind of stuff. But sometimes it's like, you know, I give the analogy of sports, you know, you go back to the basics mm -hmm. and if you get the basics right, no matter what else we call mm -hmm. it or where we come to it from, we can do it the right way. Now, on the other hand, every time a new technology comes out and people kind of lose their mind, like, how do I use this technology? Like, okay, more work for me. But, still. <laughs> but you know, you go back to media selection models. I mean, right. that, so it's, it's really kind of an interesting field in that um, there's a lot of churn mm -hmm. in the field and people, we have a collective loss of memory a lot of times and you see the same, you know, there's this whole thing now about the myths and the, Dale's cone and the numbers and the learning styles. And it just, it, it's unfortunately, I don't think it's ever going to not resurface because people are in and out uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That constant churn here allows uh, misconceptions, myths to pervade. It, you know, a lot of it has face validity. And so people go with that yeah. because it just makes sense. You know, don't turn away from the, uh, turn away from the curb, cur uh, skid, don't turn into the skid because that's counterintuitive. So right. we're, we're, we're endlessly battling that. And I, and I thank you for bringing that up about Addy because I've had uh, it just suggests that people don't understand what Addy ideally can be versus how it's actually practiced, which Practice, you know, right. there's, a yeah, huge, exactly. there's a huge gap between all Right. That. I mean, you look at the Kent Morrison and Ross model, and there's one more person now added onto it, I think. But basically, it was iterative. Right. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah. And that's the whole thing about uh, formative evaluation is iteration. So it's not necessarily a waterfall model unless you make it a waterfall model. And people say, well, why do you teach it in your grad program? And I, I use the I say, look, you have to know there's a there's a quote attributed to Picasso that says he said, but apparently he didn't. But said basically learn the rules like uh, professionals so you can break them like an artist. And that's what I think people in our field need to do learn the rules are there times to break them sometimes but just don't break them because you have no idea what you're doing break them purposefully thank you exactly yes now let's shift into some stories we talked about this a little bit earlier and you have some stories that and what i what i'm trying to capture here is again to point people, particularly new people, to some people in our business, in, in the profession, and they're either uh, funny stories or serious stories, but to humanize people, um, or they can be experiences that you had with some of these people. But uh, when we first, when I first asked the question of who you might talk about, you mentioned uh, Allison Rosette. So yeah. can you start with that one? It's a great story. So I had always admired, you know, her work and, and, and what she'd done. She'd written so many books and saw her speak and so then I eventually became a speaker. So I'm in the speaker ready room and I had some kind of app or something on my phone and Alan is like, hey, can I look at your app? I'm like, awesome, Allison Rock. Yeah, of course you can look at it. So I handed my phone. She goes, oh, this is kind of dirty. And she takes out like a wipe and wipes <laughs> my phone and cleans it. I'm like, oh my God, Allison Rock is cleaning my phone. And then she goes, and your glasses look kind of smudged too. <laughs> give me your glass and I gave her my glasses and she cleaned my glass. I'm like, oh my God, Allison Rosin is cleaning my, oh my gosh. So I expected to die on the flight home because I pretty much, you know, was at the pinnacle of my, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just amazing. So that was an amazing experience. And the, the irony, I mean, she's the nicest person and she's so down to earth and easily approachable and she's funny too. She's really funny. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that was a great story. So I've gotten to know her since then, but, but that was a great story. Um, it's interesting, you, you had mentioned Peter Senge, and uh, I saw him speak one time, kind of at the end of his career, and it was uh, at one of the conferences, and he was supposed to talk about learning and development. And he got up there and he said, I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about climate change. And he spent the entire 90 minutes talking about, and everybody's like, what? What is he talking we're, we're not here for, I mean, it was that was, was mind-blowing. Um, so that was kind of a weird experience. And then, and then um, 
uh, we had talked about Ellie Goldratt who wrote the yes. goal, right? So, mm-hmm. so you know, again, I was in an ERP mm-hmm. software company and had to learn how companies worked. And Ellie Goldratt it was, you know, had written this huge best-selling book and was internationally known. And uh, we, I got in this small, somehow scanned my way in this small intimate room and there was Ellie and he talked and talked and I'm like, awesome. And then I had, I wanted him to sign my book, but I left it back in my hotel room and I knew if I went back, he wouldn't be there. So I, all I had was the conference proceedings back when they still printed conference proceedings. And I said, Ellie, would you, you know, and I figured his, he presented, so there'd be something in there from him. I said, Hey, Ellie, would you sign this? He said, no, not signing it. Take it away. I'm like, what are you talking about? I guess I don't sign anything. I don't write. I'm like, but not. he's like, no. And that was, it. <laughs> and I, I find out later, that's pretty much <laughs> Ellie Cole. <Yes. laughs> like he was a character. I mean, he would talk about, you know, he would talk about like how he was a war fighter first and he just kind of did this on the side and performance improvement and all that kind of stuff. And then I don't name this person, but this was kind of like a surreal experience. Early in my career, as I was teaching uh, software to these manufacturing companies, a lot of them didn't even have training rooms. So I was in the back of a warehouse one time, very dark and teaching about ERP and MRP. And I was going through the concept and uh, this consultant guy who was working with them literally like comes out of the dark walks up to me and goes, you know, Carl, we call that, I call that the USA principle. Understand, simplify, and automate. I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Can I can I use that? And he's like, fine. And then he almost, you know, the movies where like the person like just backs away, kind of like he did that. Like and I've never <laughs> seen him since or before or anything. But he like bestowed the USA principle upon me and just laughed. That was like the most weirdest experience I've ever had. But that really sparked a lot of thought about, okay, well, you know, let's not automate things because they need to be automated. Let's automate them correctly. And then another funny story about that is I was writing for an industry magazine and I wrote an article called The Emperor Has No Clothes. Basically, we can't automate everything with these ERP systems because da, da, da. I get a call from the editor and he goes, Carl, can you please pick up the magazine? I'm like, okay. And he goes, can you please page through the magazine? I'm like, can you please notice the advertisements in the magazine? And Dan goes, look who's sponsoring this magazine. We will not print your article <laughs> <laughs> unless you change it. I'm like, wow. that was So that was my first introduction to like the vendor side of how the industries work. Mm-hmm. And that, that was an eye opener as well, like a naive college kid. And all of a sudden, oh, this is where the dollars flow from. So that was kind of interesting. But I find I find I find most of the uh, folks in um, the field are so approachable. You know, in my uh, I um, I would say to anybody, if there's somebody there that you think you want to talk to, just go ahead and approach them and talk to them and ask them stuff. And because everyone is really kind of friendly and uh, great to get along. And you know, my wife, said, we went to out one time to dinner, and but everyone has kind of like a big personality or kind of a little bit of an ego. And I'll put a little bit some quotes. And my wife's like, yeah, how do you hang out with all those people? With, you know, those egos. And then she goes, Oh, I know. <laughs> That's why she's hanging out with you. Yeah. yeah right. She, yeah. She's like, Oh, I know because you've got, you know, you're the same way. So, but I just, I told her, so I said, no, people just like to talk about what they do and you know, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of funny, but, she keeps me grounded, so uh, you know that's a good thing to have. <laughs> so before uh, before we uh, go to the closing of this here, I, I wanted to say that when I started following you on social media and you were talking about how you got into this whole gamification thing, it was a because you were playing games with your with your son and you were watching he and his friends, I guess, playing these games, and you had a big aha moment. Can you share a little? I bit? did so. Yeah, so I just got into Bloomsburg maybe a year, maybe two years at Bloomsburg, and um, we had gotten James Bond 007 Nightfire for the PlayStation, which was one of the coolest video games still to this day. And um, I'm, I'm down there, and so clients and everything are like, you know, the e-learning is kind of boring, and it was, it was everyone was excited about slides and audio, right? Audio-based slides were like the coolest thing. Because, again, we had this really cool CD-ROM stuff, but it all went away when the Internet came because 
for years, you couldn't do video on the internet, couldn't do images on the internet. It was very painful. And I'm thinking, this can't be the only way to do instruction. There's got to be a different way. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm literally in the basement. It's like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I'm thinking, okay, this time I have to run around that garbage can because I know there's a bad guy. And I'm like, oh, I just kind of learned that there's a bad guy. Ah. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's teaching me what to do. Why can't we take these same concepts and add those online to teach people what to do? And I didn't have a word for it. Because I came back to the university and I was like, oh, we're not a game program. We're not teaching games. That's not an academic program. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not games. It's like pieces of games. And like, what are you talking about pieces of games? Like, it's a game or it's not a game. I'm like, no, 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 it's pieces. So that's when when I found the word gamification. I'm like, oh, my God. That's exactly the word I am looking for. So, and it's kind of got usurped a little bit. I think that's why it switched a little to game thinking. But um, the concept was pieces and parts of games are the way to engage. And then as I started doing more research, I found a couple things. One is a lot of the principles of, of learning are the same exact principles that they're using in games. They just don't call them out of games. And the second thing is, oh, speaking of, of influencers, I've been doing some research. I, I saw an article this guy wrote, you know, I, I invented gamification. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure you didn't, but let me do some research on that. I mean, I know I didn't, but I'm pretty sure that guy didn't. And I looked, and um, no, like back in the late 60s, people like Tiagi were pioneering uh, game-based alert for corporations. And mm -hmm. Tiagi was, you know, he's been um, the ISIP president a couple times. He's been yeah. D president. I mean, he's done a long history of, of championing games when, when it was popular and when it wasn't popular. And so... Um, if, if you're going to credit anyone, it would be Tiagi with that, not, you know, this random guy on the internet. Um, but the interesting thing is one of the books I was reading said back in the late 60s that corporations were using games as a badge of honor in their executive uh, suites. Like, oh, they're, and the author was lamenting that, oh, they're just talking about games because they want everybody to recognize them or whatever. And I'm like, okay. Then we hit, that was like 60s, 70s, then we hit the 80s and we all went back to basics and nobody could do any games because they were a four-letter word. And now in 2000, the term serious game was invented, even though it wasn't it was invented back in the 70s. So it's really interesting how, you know, and you you do a lot of this, which really well, saying, hey, this new term, this is really this term, and this new thing, we've been doing it for decades. So games, same thing. Like, it's been ongoing for decades. I mean, the first gamification simulation was back in the 30s, a woman in Russia. I mean, for a corporate environment, you know, mm -hmm. you, could, you could count like green stamps and all that kind of stuff. But I think the corporate environment, that was for, so, so there's nothing, you know, it's not new under the sun. And we have a collective amnesia a lot of times. And so those kind of, I think it, it, everyone in this field, it's, it's in your best interest to go back and read a little bit about what has come before you. You're standing on the shoulders of other people. You're not just shazamming stuff out of nowhere. And to your earlier point, you could be the guy who looks at a failure because there was a lot of failures in the past and we can learn from them and avoid them and not be right. that guy, right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, Carl, thank you so much for participating with me in this video interview as I uh, begin to wrap this up here. Um, what I'm looking for are any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially people new to the field, whether they're younger or middle-aged or older, but new to the field, what, what kind of guidance would you have for them? So my primary guidance is really to do your homework about the trends and the terms and the things that you're hearing and seeing. There's a lot of noise out there uh, about the field and about how to improve uh, human performance, and there's a lot of really good research, so go back to the research or go to the people that write about the research, look into the research to make sure that you use an evidence-based approach. And the research isn't perfect. Like, research is not a holy grail. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's not the, you know, Koran. It's, it's, it's human attempt at getting to the truth. So sometimes there's contradictory research. Sometimes the research is very narrow. But by having that grounding in research, you can make more intelligent decisions and more rational decisions. And that's really 
at the end of the day, you know, the scientific method is a step-by-step rational approach to problem solving. And that's really what you should follow. So I, I would recommend anybody kind of ground themselves in the, in that process um, and really approach it from an evidence-based resource, not, oh, I heard this, or, oh, I think this, or this seems to be the new fad. Like, I, you know, I told, I've told people, like, no, do not do gamification. Don't, you're not ready. It's not the right approach to this problem. Don't, don't approach it that way. Do this instead. So, um, you know, have the conviction to know when things will work and when things won't work. And that comes from the evidence, the research, the case studies, all that kind of stuff. And then having said all that, every once in a while, just take a flyer, right? Yeah, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know, but let's try it. Like, let's just see if it works. You know, don't do that, you know, uh, without some grounding. But every once in a while, you got to push the envelope a little bit. Excellent. Thank you so much. Carl, thanks for sharing your uh, wisdom and insight with us today. Uh, Have a great day. Thanks for having me. Yep.